For as long as I can remember, I've wanted to fly. I wanted to jump into a flying car and have it take me soaring. Imagine a future, just a few years away, when unpiloted aerial drones and air taxis are shuttling people, parcels, mail, pizza, auto parts, you name it, around the urban and even not so urban landscapes. So why don't we have this yet? We have all sorts of drones and urban mobility vehicles capable of flight. It's not the vehicles, it's the lack of operational protocols for safety. It's developing the rules of the road, the systems for managing traffic, and most importantly, the systems for automating the design of the flight path itself. I'm David Russell, CTO of Aereo. I started my career developing auto routages for printed circuit boards and ICs. In fact, I developed the very first PCB auto router for PCs back in 1980. And I wrote just about every kind of router there is, including proprietary designs, for 15 years. Since then, I've been researching control systems for the last 10 years, and UAVs specifically the last five. So it obviously occurred to me that if I could extend my decades of knowledge from 2D auto routers into 3D space, we could apply this as a powerful tool for managing safe drone flight paths with all sorts of valuable qualities. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Just building flight paths is, as we say, necessary but not sufficient. In this session, we're going to share some exciting innovations that we've been developing around flight path automation system specifically designed for low altitude aerial vehicles. The system consists of a new flight path creation algorithm that enables and supports more intelligent UTM and detect and avoid systems, or DAA a new definition of flight trajectories that supports dimensions beyond the standard X, Y, and Z, a new addition to standard navigation and flight control in autopilots to allow precision flight in space and time, a new way of helping to automate the mission planning functions. In fact, these are so exciting that we're in the process of standing up a new company, Aereo, to bring this technology to market. We're in the very early stages, and we're looking to connect with you to see if there are any potential areas of collaboration. We set out thinking about how to safely operate multiple aerial drones in a shared airspace around complex urban landscapes. Since 80% of the U.S. population lives in urban environments, and urban populations will increase to 89% by 2050, it means that the bulk of UAV logistics and UAM human transport will have to coexist in crowded and complex airspaces. How are we planning to cope with this? A lot of the thinking around managing complex airspaces has been lumped into unmanned traffic management or UTM. This was our initial thinking as well. But the deeper we got into thinking about how to build deconflicted flight paths inside a UTM solution, the more complex and cumbersome it became. That complexity arises because fundamentally, traffic management is really a command and control idea that works for linear systems. But the future of aerial mobility is not a linear system, it's an exponential system. It occurred to us that in the existing paradigm, there are four core ecosystem components needed to safely manage multiple vehicles in a shared airspace. We need a traffic management system to coordinate among vehicles in the entire airspace. We need mid-flight collision avoidance systems, which involves all of these elements, but mostly detect and avoid. We need an autopilot or other navigational system capable of executing the flight plan within the UAV. And we need a flight plan management system for each vehicle that defines the mission and builds deconfliction into the flight path. This realization that we needed to transform our own thinking led us to recognize that what we are facing isn't a traffic management problem, but a flight path design problem. So we reframed our thinking around the question, who should control the flight path planning process in an automated environment? 
Today, the pilot controls the flight path, but as we develop greater autonomy, systems will have to control it. We initially started thinking that UTM would handle flight path planning, but that puts a lot of responsibility for managing the entire airspace on a single system. Also, the UTM tends to see the world as risk, so focuses on constraints. Drone operators want to focus on the mission objectives, and constraints tend to make that job harder. If the flight path is well designed in the first place, it may not need to be overly constrained. Autopilots can try to manage flight paths, and indeed, once a flight path is known, a smart autopilot system can be instrumental in executing the flight path. But like detecting a void, the autopilot needs to have a clean algorithm focused on navigation and stability, not planning. Detect and avoid can't really handle flight path planning either. Detect and avoid's primary objective is collision avoidance, and those systems need to be very responsive, which requires clean algorithms. If we burden the algorithms with all sorts of mission requirements and sub-objectives, it runs the risk of failing its primary mission. There are other reasons why detect and avoid shouldn't be responsible for flight paths. The uncertainty, unpredictability, the inability to integrate time functions very well, and a few others that we'll share throughout this talk. In the end, detect and avoid approach used for flight paths often looks like... Go that way, really fast. If something gets in your way, turn. More important is that the UTM, Detect and Avoid, and Autopilots are all self-contained systems with minimal human interface. And while our goal is to automate much of the mission planning process, it inherently becomes garbage in, garbage out. It requires at least some human interaction to describe the mission plan. This left us with the growing awareness that in an automated, self-sustaining ecosystem that integrates flight paths, Detect and Avoid, UTM and autopilots, the flight path becomes an essential element that can, when what done well, inform and support deconflicted mission objectives. Just like piloted systems, where the flight controller is a human pilot relying on about three pounds of highly evolved neural network, in automated systems, flight paths also need to be robust, safe, and stable while existing in a highly dynamic environment. They need to be automated to the extent they can be, but they must also allow the operator to retain overall control of the mission. In other words, the flight paths must be resilient. That was our aha moment. So then our ultimate goal turned into designing and developing an automated system that constructs resilient flight paths. A resilient flight path is robust, safe, and stable while operating in a shared space that is highly dynamic. In this case, dynamic means continuous and sometimes unexpected change. Before we get into that detail, it's helpful to think about how flight paths are currently developed and executed. It starts with someone manually reviewing mission objectives, launch locations, destinations, waypoints along the desired path. The pilot or operator must refer to maps, data, regulation sets, find any geofences, coordinate with other potential operators, maybe get regulatory approvals. But after all of this, at the time of flight, the pilot or operator has no idea if this flight is convicted or not. Thinking in terms of resiliency of a flight path, a system that embodies self-organizing networks of flight paths is inherently more resilient than a traffic management system that only seeks to control and modify vehicles within static structures. A number of UTM strategies have sought to simplify the problem by restricting the airspace through layering, corridors, tunnels, and so on. This does make traffic management simpler but it inevitably constricts the usable airspace and forces higher vehicle densities, which leads to more UTM and detect and avoid problems to be solved. In short, most flight path design and management today is a manual process, but it doesn't have to be. In fact, it shouldn't be. In terms of scalability, it can't be, because a manual process is inherently time-consuming, not scalable, 
expensive, and prone to human factor errors. If we could deliver a resilient flight path management system, it would enable some really interesting functional capabilities and benefits to the overall UAM and UAV operational ecosystem, such as fleet management functions, the ability for a single operator to manage entire fleets very efficiently, self-organized virtual highway, we'll show some examples of this, autopilot integrations that provide precise path execution and timing, accurate arrival time predictions and scheduling capabilities, and lots of different mission type optimizations for lots of different use cases. To move towards our goal, we first identified nine essential criteria for flight path management system we could call resilient. It must find paths that achieve mission objectives, ideally in some optimized way. It must operate within the available navigation space. Low altitude airspaces themselves are dynamic. The landscapes change a lot in many different ways. It must not conflict with any other planned flight plans operating in the shared space. We call this flight path deconfliction. It must not conflict with any unplanned objects operating in the airspace. In other words, it must have the capacity to integrate with existing detect and avoid systems. It must comply with regulations. This is a team effort. It must be able to integrate into varied ecosystems of traffic management systems, vehicles, prescriptive rules, and geofences. The vehicle must be able to execute the flight path in real time. This has been a major sticking point in flight pan construction, given the state of many of the existing autopilots. It must be able to deliver multiple flight paths quickly and simultaneously. It must be able to track, report, schedule, map, and otherwise provide for the standard management functions, not just for any one vehicle, but for an entire fleet of vehicles. And eventually, the system should be smart enough to integrate machine learning and other AI capabilities so that it can be fast, efficient, and relevant to a wide variety of aerial vehicle use cases. As the environment becomes even more dynamic, the systems will have to become even more self-organizing. Otherwise, we're continually painting ourselves into corners. Okay, so now that we've outlined the framework, let's dive into how this AutoPath system we're developing works. The core of the resilient flight path system is based on two components. The first is the path routing system itself that we're calling AutoPath. This is an integration of geospatial data, auto routing algorithms, and big data IT. It runs on a server farm so that it has all of the information it requires to analyze the mission profile, determine and construct the appropriate data sets and cost metrics, and then find and deconflict the path. The second technology is a new lightweight addition to the flight navigation and control system of the autopilot we call the Continuous Path Regulator, or CPR. The regulator's job is to enable the vehicle to fly precise, timed, paths, where the location of the vehicle is known for every moment of time. This is a prerequisite to true deconfliction. First, we'll consider the AutoPath system. There are a lot of pieces to this, but today we'll focus on the four core elements. They are the navigation space model, pathfinding and auto routing algorithms, how we use geospatial cost functions to optimize the path for the mission, and a couple of innovations we developed to support detect and avoid capabilities, some things we call avoidance limits and multidimensional trajectories. The navigational space model is the space within which aerial vehicles can operate. To generate that model, we rely on the geospatial community where there is an abundance of data. We simply identify and extract the buildings, trees, geofences, and other non-operational areas. It turns out this is not a trivial task, especially in an urban environment. The model of this environment will be highly complex and dynamic. These may be both raster and 3D model forms. 
Other data may be stored in raster form and updated more frequently or accessed immediately via ABI calls to weather, GIS databases, FAA links, etc. Once we have a well-defined navigational space model for any operating environment, we then have the canvas for drawing up possible paths and routes. To find a path through a concrete jungle in space and time, we fall back on the auto-routing technology. It's well known, it's been around since the 60s, so it's well tested. This is basically the tech that finds routes on Google, so it should be able to inform in automated vehicle flight paths. To be clear, we talk of auto-routing as one of a family of algorithms and pathfinding as the result of those algorithms for this particular application. There are generally two types of auto-routing algorithms, maze or matrix routers and probe or line routers. These algorithms have been extensively investigated, so we won't cover them here, except to say that in general, grid routers tend to search the entire solution space and are guaranteed to find a path if one exists, but they're slow because of the amount of computation involved. Probe routers seek to find quick and easy solutions, but they don't guarantee to find quick results. One other area is important. In grid routers, traditionally the way the data is stored means that two routes cannot search the same area at the same time. An important feature of our dynamic database is that we have removed this restriction, allowing multiple simultaneous searches in the same space. To get our vehicle from the source point S to the destination point D, we draw a straight line between the two and use its coordinates to query the dynamic database for the navigational space model. If there is a path with no obstructions, we have some quick version of an up over down route, depending on the mission and the cost profile for that flight. If there is an obstruction, we break the line into subsections. Each subsection then spawns a routing agent. Since the dynamic database allows all routing agents to work in parallel and the server farm runs them at the same time, each break in the segment actually spawns several agents. Whichever agent returns the best path wins. Using agents in parallel this way improves the routing speed by orders of magnitude. Once the agents have returned with a valid route between the two points, we can apply various methods of splines, line straightening, and deconflection to the line. We can also, for example, keep track over time of where the routes are going and at what time. As more routes try to move through a given area in a given direction, this can be analyzed to build self-organizing corridors, encouraging routes to seek these areas and directions and guide others to similar self-organizing paths in different directions. Over time, the ebb and flow of traffic will normally redistribute itself to other areas, and the effects of this corridor will fade and others will grow in its place. The ability to self-organize in this fashion is critical to the resiliency of the system as crowding increases. To summarize, simultaneously solving the pathfinding and auto-routing in multi-dimensions for multiple vehicles is incredibly complicated. We've had to pull a lot of tricks out of the hat and we still have a lot of complex elements to figure out, but our progress is very promising. Let me shift now to the cost functions. The cost function is the cumulative list of parameters used to evaluate the best path. In theory, cost functions can be quite sophisticated. In practice, they tend to be crude approximations and as such often deliver a false level of precision. In fact, the way that most geospatial systems like ArcGIS generate paths looks really pretty, but when you peek under the hood, often they are not very accurate. In fact, sometimes they over-constrain the path, and other times they imply just a false precision. Such auto-routers by themselves cannot deliver the best solution. They provide one of perhaps many potential solutions that are good enough as defined by the cost parameters. The traditional cost function is usually just that, a coded routine that applies weighting values to each relevant feature it sees in the grid being processed. We are envisioning not just a single cost function, but a multi-dimensional array of cost functions. When we change the cost function, it changes the routes produced. This makes it adaptable for various use cases and mission plans. 
For example, a cost matrix for an urban delivery use case might define costs by minimizing flight time or distance or maximizing range and speed, depending on the mission profile. Then each cost in that profile might be further altered by time of day or weather. Alternatively, a search and rescue application might use a cost model based on likely deviations from existing roads and paths, and that requires inputs for existing roads, paths, search scenarios, behavioral assumptions, sheltering buildings, water sources, and so on. Or an environmental monitoring application using multiple vehicles with different sensor types might determine flight paths based on vegetation, soils, and hydrography data sets. The best fit cost function for the exact mission profile, vehicle, time, and conditions can be selected by a heuristic, but it is also a good candidate for the application of AI for scalability. So to summarize, the cost functions are the primary tool we use for optimizing mission requirements. Our current application of cost functioning is pretty simple, so we can focus on the core functionality of the system. We anticipate that over time, the cost functions will become incredibly sophisticated and will be built upon machine learning and other AI technologies. The last major piece we want to discuss is the innovation we're bringing that empowers detect and avoid UTM and autopilots to all work together better. There has always been a fundamental issue with pre-computed paths, the inability to deal with surprises. Most current systems define a flight path based on hitting waypoints, or in some cases, way fields, 2D versions of waypoints. However, what happens between the waypoints is a huge unknown. And in considering deconfliction, it's a little like horseshoes and hand grenades. Proximity matters. With waypoint-based systems, we don't know the precise position for 99% of the flight. We also don't have clear knowledge of the direction, speed, or timing. This makes deconfliction of the flight path entirely dependent on sensory detection. But we want to create flight paths that are primarily deconflicted pre-flight and rely on detect and void as a backup for the unanticipated events. So our little innovation is a combination of two key ideas. The use of multidimensional trajectory-based paths and a vehicle buffer we call the avoidance limit. So adding a few additional dimensions gives us more degrees of freedom during the pathfinding, auto-routing, and deconfliction steps. It also enables us to bring mathematical precision and gives us much more precise control of the vehicle. As opposed to waypoints, we start by defining a path trajectory as independent dimensions with respect to time. This allows us to consider the trajectory of the vehicle as a continuous path, and every point in time is mathematically associated with a point in space. For example, here is a path in X, Y, and Z altitude. In a system of dependent dimensions, we can simplify them by projecting them into an arbitrary additional dimension. Since we really want time to be a part of the trajectory anyway, we can simplify this to X is a function of time, Y is a function of time, and z is a function of time. We're used to thinking in terms of three dimensions, but there's no actual limit on the number of dimensions that make up a trajectory. If we add another dimension, we'll call it an avoidance limit or dimension A, it doesn't matter to the rest of the flight control system. The avoidance limit can be thought of as a sphere that travels the same trajectory as the vehicle, but is independent of it. Or you can think of it as a spherical inverse geofence. When the pre-computed paths are designed, we create this avoidance sphere to take the path spacing requirements into account such that the sphere is always clear of other vehicles or obstructions. We can maneuver within this radius of the sphere, knowing that as long as we remain within the limit, we will not impact any other path. If we take that to its logical conclusion, the time frame that the auto router applies to the avoidance limit can range from zero, just a sphere around the current location, to a spread of minutes if the takeoff time is not well known, or to the duration of the entire flight, which makes it a tube that represents 
that the vehicle should be considered anywhere within that tube or even a permanent corridor. Now that we have all the system components, we want to test the systems to see if we can demonstrate a proof of concept and identify its strengths and weaknesses. In this section, we'll describe a few of our early simulations for one of the most complex urban landscapes around, the Financial District of San Francisco. We coded the four-dimensional auto router and constructed its navigation model from a 10-meter digital elevation model of downtown San Francisco. We routed from 10 to over 300 vehicles with random start endpoints through a one square kilometer space utilizing all four dimensions. In these initial tests of random routes, all of the lines were deconflicted simply by choosing a better non-conflicting route. We can force time deconfliction to occur in some test cases, but we are still investigating how dense the random vehicle population needs to be before four dimensional deconfliction occurs naturally. To better characterize the compute time of the grid router, we ran the entire pass set with the grid-based auto router based on Lee's algorithm at a 10 meter grid, but with full three-dimensional expansion of the initial grid cube with its 26 neighbors. As expected, this was slow, as long as 10 minutes per route. We expect to significantly reduce this compute time with our hybrid router and with some other tricks we have up our sleeves. Our initial runs ran into some issues with the resolution. Using 10 meter grids resulted in some flight paths clipping buildings. In some cases, like the Salesforce Tower, the tallest building in San Francisco, the flight pass went right through the building because our data set had a parking lot where the building was. For the most part, the simulations were very successful. We were able to successfully deconflict 100% of the flight paths with respect to other vehicles for a system with 300 vehicles simultaneously operating in one square kilometer landscape. The few issues we ran into were mostly due to errors in the geospatial data and programmatic bugs at the end of the routing matrix. Some interesting behaviors of the path routing algorithm are visible in this Google Earth display of the routes. Stair steps and 45 degree angle turns are common artifacts of grid-based routers and the cost function architecture. These will be resolved as cost functions and line straightening processes are improved. A second simulation of 11 UAM vehicles lifting off from a theoretical distribution center at the ferry building shows some corridor development. This was designed to simulate the kind of flight operations we might expect at a vertiport or delivery distribution center. In this simulation, we routed vehicles to three other vertiports in the simulated model space. The longest of these routes in simulation time was six minutes. Notice the rightmost paths took a slightly longer route around the right side of the initial building obstruction as moving left would have conflicted with other routes. Here are replays of the routes from different angles. Now we've demonstrated that our AutoPath system is capable of identifying an entire fleet of flight paths that are deconflicted with regard to other planned flights and can still be empowered with detect and avoid systems to avoid unplanned conflicts. But the planned deconfliction is only as good as the vehicle's execution of the planned flight path, including the essential factor of continuous compliance to its planned position as a function of time. So we need one last core piece, the continuous path regulator, or CPR. CPR is a lightweight set of equations that is in addition to the flight navigation and control system of any autopilot. Most control loops work by sensing an error term. Here's the state of the machine, there's the output we're looking for, change the controls to try to make the error go away. Others may recall the term PID loop. CPR is different. Instead of trying to minimize the error term, it starts with the existing state of the machine, the current time, position, and velocity. We assume there's always some error due to wind, external forces, a bent propeller, anything. Now, if we know the desired next state of the machine, 
we can actually calculate the exact mathematical simultaneous solution to transition the machine from the initial state to the next state. The question then is how do we know what the next machine state is supposed to be? We can know that if we have a trajectory that specifies the exact path and time we want to follow. Aha! That is why we've designed the trajectory as independent dimensions with continuous functions with respect to time. The output of the first equation is a parabola of the velocity for each x, y, and z dimension, which simultaneously solves for the change in velocity and change in position within the exact sample time. The second equation executes the velocity profile. So these two equations are the core of the CPR. The vehicle is now capable of flying a complex timed path and staying on time, on velocity, and on position for the entire path. This figure shows the z dimension of an example path and how closely the CPR algorithm in the flight system can follow that path. Remember that the purpose of CPR is to give an exact solution to keep the vehicle on position, on velocity, and on time for every sample, whatever forces are applied. This second graph shows a zoomed-in view of the path. The simulation applies an arbitrary miscalculation to the motor controls and random gusts of wind up to five times the speed of the vehicle. The small blips you can see are the system reacting to the rapid 180 degree change in wind velocity. So there we have it, a comprehensive system for delivering automated resilient flight paths. We believe that automated flight path management systems should be an essential component to the UAV and UAM operational ecosystem, at least as important as UTM, autopilots, and detect and avoid systems themselves. Our autopath and CPR approach to resilience flight paths works with detect and avoid, UTM, and vehicle navigation systems, and all of the other elements that are evolving within the emerging market paradigm. In fact, not only does it work, but we believe that it has the capacity to make these complementary systems work better with flight panel automation as part of the mix. Automation is better, faster, cheaper, and safer than reliance on piloted systems or other human interfaces, or UTM, or detect and avoid alone. As a system, it just works better. Autopath provides true and precise auto routing that constructs deconflicted flight paths that maximize safety, enables organic self-organization of flight corridors, optimizes airspace utilization, and selects a flight path more suitable to the mission objectives. Autopath anticipates potential conflicts along the entire flight path, enabling minor, almost imperceptible avoidance maneuvers that can begin and end well before the conflicting vehicle is within sensor range. Autopath also could provide a wide array of management functions, precise scheduling, expected arrival alerts, tracking, automated authorizations, coordination with UTM systems, reporting, and so on. And one of the core benefits of CPR is that it would prevent vehicles from being used for nefarious purposes. Essentially, the CPR locks the navigation into an improved flight path, so the vehicles cannot be hijacked in flight. There are lots of other benefits to this kind of a system, and we don't really have any more time to go into it here. We're still happy to answer questions, and you can find us at our virtual booth or drop me an email at daver at aereo.io on the screen. As we further develop the system, we anticipate that a single fleet operator would be able to manage the entire fleet at a planning cost reduction of about 85% or better. We are still very early in the development of the system, and we are probably at least a year away from having a fully commercial product available. We're obviously eager to collaborate with others in the industry. We'd love to connect with you, and if you'd like to play along with us, there's lots of ways you can plug in. We need test projects. We need a few vendors for core subcomponents, especially geospatial data providers. We need some funding to get our little startups launched. Exponential is kind of our coming out party. 
We are looking to hire a few great engineers, data scientists, and other technical types in the coming months. We need to have some great conversations that can help us think about this stuff even deeper. And we would love any moral support along the way. So if you can help in any of these areas, or we can help you, please don't hesitate to reach out to us or visit our online booth. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors and partners in crime. Michael LaCorey, my business partner and our CEO, who spent many hours honing out this paper and the talk. Fred Meyer, my friend and colleague who put in countless hours on the database architecture, coding, animations, and so on. He's our big data guru. Finally, and most importantly, thank all of you for taking the time to attend the presentation.